We're going to start now. Thank you so much for, for joining us today on our seventh session. Uh, today we're going to be focusing on home safety and our speaker today, Natalie, is uh, an occupational therapist and we're very privileged to work with her in our clinic at the Memory Clinic here. So uh, just some housekeeping items. Um, there is a mic in the middle of the room, so if you want to ask some questions, please go to the mic. Uh, but if you don't want your voice or face recorded, you can certainly write down the questions and one of us will be happy to, to ask those questions on your behalf. Uh, washrooms are just out the door on your left hand side. Um, there are questionnaires that we hope that you are able to fill out and there are refreshments outside as well. And we also want to thank the donors for making this event possible. So we will get started and here's Natalie. Okay. Hi everyone. All right, let's get started. Let's talk about some home safety uh, tips and tricks and all this fun stuff. So why is it important? Why do we care about um, home safety? So it's important for everyone as we age. Um, all of us are aging. So it's not just for those individuals with cognitive impairments, but it's for all of us. Uh, traditionally, a major focus of home safety uh, is falls risk assessments and intervention uh, falls risk assessment and intervention, and that's for good reason. Um, so what we found in the research um, is that about almost 62% of seniors' hospitalizations were related to injuries that were uh, the result of falls. And that 60% of falls happen in the home. Um, and also Public, uh, Public uh, Health Canada has reported that 40 to 60% of falls are related to environmental hazards. Interesting, right? So this is why it's so important that we have a dialogue about uh, home safety and learn how we can uh, minimize our risk, our risk and our loved one's risk of injury while also supporting their function in the home. Okay, so as you can see from this very busy slide here, uh, there are a lot of risk factors uh, for falls. In the short time we have uh, here today uh, together, I'm gonna focus on some of the general safety concerns that we typically find around the home and then tailor them to common safety concerns that we encounter when working with people with dementia. We'll address things you can do to minimize danger while also maximizing independence. So what I'd like you to take away uh, this morning is that while sometimes accidents do just happen, there are definitely simple measures you can take to considerably reduce uh, the chances of you or your loved one uh, of, being, uh, of being injured in the home. So there are a lot of reasons why we fall, again, as you can see. Historically, researchers have grouped fall risk factors in a variety of ways. But typically, grouping risk factors into two main categories. So those risk factors that lie within the individual and those that lie within either the physical or socioeconomic environment. The more recent model for categorizing fall risk factors is the one shown here, which I think better demonstrates uh, the complexity and interrelationships between all of the risk factors. So you see we have biological and medical risk factors such as vision changes, chronic illness, cognitive impairment. We also have behavioral risk factors such as uh, excessive alcohol intake, inappropriate footwear or clothing, also polypharmacy. As we know with a lot of our geriatric patients, they are taking a lot of uh, different medications which may be impacting um, their behavior and therefore increasing their falls risk. As well, we have environmental risk factors, as you can see, um, as we've kind of elucidated earlier, uh, factors in the public environment, factors in the home, stairs, big things, stairs. Um, and socioeconomic factors, we're looking at income, education, um, and social connectedness. So as a result of the uh, progressive nature of the disease, 
People with dementia, over time, become increasingly unable to take care of themselves. However, the disease progresses differently in each person and in each person, and as caregivers, uh, we face the ongoing challenge of adapting to each of these, each and every one of these changes in our loved ones, behaviors, so their behaviors and their functional ability. As a result of each situation's unique challenges, I'll briefly discuss the following general principles. First, we have think prevention, then I'll be talking about adapting the environment, and finally minimizing danger. So let's take a look at prevention. It's very difficult to predict what a person with dementia might do. Uh, just because something has not yet occurred doesn't mean it should not be cause for concern. So checking the safety of your home in a preventative manner will help you take control of some of the potential problems that might create hazardous situations. Hi, Petal. <laughs> That's all good. Um, and now we'll explore um, adapting the environment a bit more. Um, so it's more effective to change the environment than it is to change most behaviors. While some dementia behaviors in some people can be managed with medications, others may not. So you can make changes in your home to decrease the hazards and stressors that accompany these behavioral and functional changes. So as you can see, by minimizing danger, you can maximize your loved one's independence. And by implementing some changes to your home, you can create a safer environment that can be a less restrictive environment where the person with dementia can experience increased security and greater mobility. So as I mentioned earlier, prevention begins with a safety check of every room in your home. You can use room-by-room -room checklists to alert you to potential hazards and to help you record any changes you need to make. Keep in mind that it may not be necessary to make all of the suggested changes, so checklists can cover a wide range of safety concerns that may arise, and some modifications may actually never be needed. It's important, though, to reevaluate home safety periodically and in a preventative manner as behavior and ability changes. I also recognize that some changes you make may impact your surroundings positively, and some may affect you in ways that may be inconvenient or undesirable. It's possible, though, to strike a balance. It's important for you as caregivers to make adaptations that modify and simplify without se severely disrupting the home for both yourself and your loved one with dementia. Too much change will cause confusion. So as a caregiver, you may want to consider having a special area for yourself. A space off limits to anyone else and arranged exactly as you would prefer. As it's important for everyone to have a quiet time and privacy and this becomes especially crucial for caregivers. You don't have to make these changes alone though. As we always say, enlist the help of family, friends, caregivers, health professionals, and any other community services. So now we'll go through some common safety prevention tips that can be applied throughout the home. So starting off, a good tip, post emergency telephone numbers or commonly used numbers as well as your home address near all telephones in big, bold, high contrast font. Phone numbers can also be programmed into phone memory and labeled with a name or a picture. Large button or programmable phones can also assist with correct dialing. If the person is unable to take messages, leave the voicemail on and turn down the ringer. This can help to avoid distraction and confusion. Also, installing smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors in or near the kitchen and all sleeping areas ensuring that you're maintaining assessment and checking their functioning and batteries frequently. Also, installing secure locks on all outside doors and windows, and hide a spare house key outside or leave one with a trusted neighbor in case the person with dementia locks you out of the home, unfortunately.
You're also going to want to look at avoiding the use of extension cords if possible. If you find the need to use them, you can tack extension cords to the baseboards of a room to avoid tripping. Cover unused electrical outlets with childproof plugs. Place red tape around floor vents, radiators, and other heating devices to deter the person with dementia from standing on or touching them when hot. Check all rooms and areas for adequate lighting. And keep all medications, prescription and over-the-counter, locked. So each bottle of prescription medicine should be clearly labeled with the person's name, the name of the drug, the drug strength, the dosage, frequency, and expiration date. Keep all alcohol in a locked cabinet and or out of reach of the person with dementia. If smoking is prohibited, monitor the person with dementia while he or she is smoking. Uh, remove matches, lighters, ashtrays, cigarettes, and other means of smoking from view. This reduces fire hazards, and with these reminders out of sight, the person may forget the desire to smoke. And lastly, avoiding clutter, which can um, create confusion and danger. So throw out or recycle newspapers, magazines, and do this regularly. Keep all areas where people walk free of furniture. And this slide is pretty self-explanatory. Keeping plastic bags out of reach, remove all potentially harmful or sharp objects out of view, lock all power tools and machinery away, remove all poisonous plants, remove poisonous cleaning products from site, and as I mentioned earlier, ensure vents and heating elements are not covered. So approximately 15% of falls occur in the bathroom and on the stairs. They're responsible for, responsible for more injuries than any other household area or product. So we'll explore these two areas a little bit more in depth. So the stairs. Things that we need to consider when assessing kind of the safety risk that a flight of stairs may pose. You should have solid handrails on at least one, but preferably on both sides of the stairway. Stairways need to be well lit. Ideally, light switches should be at the top and at the bottom of the staircase. Safety on stairs can also be optimized if the stairs are carpeted or have safety grip strips. Bright colored tape on the edges of steps can help prevent falls by making it easier to see each step. Ensuring that we're maintaining our stairs, ensuring that the steps are sturdy, in good repair, and free of clutter. Lastly, don't place any objects on the steps and make sure that any objects on landing do not distract or obstruct. So here's a picture of some stairs. And I don't know, what, what do you think works well for these stairs? What do we have that, you know, I just discussed? One of the things. We have handrails. Pretty solid. Um, is there, are they carpeted? Are there any grip strips? No. So, not ideal. Um, color contrast. Not so much, right? So these might pose a bit of a, a risk. Okay. <laughs> These stairs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it looks like they're not free of clutter, clutter being the snow. Um, and yeah, so it looks, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, carrying objects, not necessarily a great idea. If you do need to carry objects when you're going up and down the stairs, don't use large laundry baskets on the stairs. You don't use anything that um, requires both of your hands to hold, because um, it may block the view of the steps. And just instead, consider using um, a laundry bag or something that can be carried on one hand or dragged or thrown down the stairs. So one hand should always be free to hold onto a handrail and again, cleaning the um, stairways. These pictures are a bit dated, but we're gonna go with it. 
So um, as again, again, you can see here, um, minimal contrast, uh, slip risk, there's no carpeting, no grip strips, yeah. These are a set of stairs that actually kind of more or less follow our recommendations in the sense that we have those grip strips. There's high color contrast. We've got sturdy railings on both sides bilaterally and no clutter, nothing. So these, A plus for these stairs. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how old this picture is. It's a lot, there's a lot going on here. Um, so just a bit of clutter, maybe? Just a bit of clutter. Uh, you notice there's something on the landing. Um, it's, there's a lot of distracting material here. Despite the fact that they're carpeted, um, you know, again, you run the risk of, of falls just because of the sheer clutter and cognitive confusion here. All right. So we covered stairs. And now we're gonna talk a little bit more about the bathroom, because as we know, that's where a lot of our falls happen. 15% to be exact. So um, for the bathroom, don't leave your loved one uh, with dementia alone in the bathroom. Um, remove the lock from the bathroom door to prevent the person uh, from getting locked inside. Or alternatively, what uh, some people have done is just tape down the latch so that when the door closes, it, do it doesn't uh, lock. Um, turn the water heater down to avoid burning. Um, so I don't know if most of you know this, but uh, most water heaters are set at about 150 degrees, which can cause burns. But someone with, a de with dementia may have a loss of sensation and uh, may not be able to interpret the feelings of heat, cold, or discomfort. So by setting the water heater a little bit lower to about 120, you can avoid scalding tap water. Also remove small electrical appliances and cover electrical outlets. Place non-skid adhesive strips, decals, or mats in the tub and shower. If the bathroom is uncarpeted, consider placing these strips next to the tub, toilet, and sink. Uh, those areas can get wet and cause slipping hazards. As well, you have the option of installing grab bars in the tub and shower. A grab bar in contrasting color to the wall is easier to see. Um, you can also use a raised toilet seat with handrails or install grab bars beside the toilet, facilitating the transfer on and off the toilet, again, minimizing the risk for falls. You can also use a shower chair in combination with a handheld shower head to make bathing easier and more safe. And as well, use a foam, you could use a foam uh, rubber faucet cover in the tub to, to prevent serious injury should someone fall. So instead of, you know, hitting their head on that hard metal, you've got a little cover that's a little more of a cushion. Again, we're hoping for no falls, but in the event, we always want to, uh, to prevent uh, any harm. Okay, so here's another, here's a picture of a washroom. I don't know, also a little dated, but it works. Uh, I'm not seeing any bath mats, no anti-slip grip strips, no grab bars. I see a handheld shower, but again, no seat. So these are all things to consider. There's high, high shine here. Um, if our individual with dementia has uh, vision deficits, that could further cause confusion and safety risks. Okay. All right, and this bathroom, as you can see, has a lot, a lot going on. Um, I think I'll just, yeah. So aside from just kind of keeping with and, you know, attending to the safety of the home inside, we also have to take into consideration that falls can also happen outside the home. So looking at how to increase the safety outside the home, around the home, um, it matters. So ensuring that uh, the steps to enter and exit the home are sturdy and textured. Uh, mark the edges of each step with a brighter tape or paint, if possible. Eliminate uneven walkways and objects and restrict access to swimming pools. Make sure outside lighting is adequate and prune brushes and foliage well away from walkways and doorways.
again, removing any tripping ha hazards or um, confusing information. So we've talked a lot about equipment and home safety, but how do we acquire this equipment? So working in the hospital, you know, I have a lot of caregivers and, you know, patients' family come and say, you know, this is great, you're recommending a bath seat, grab bars and all that, but how do we get it? So um, there are several vendors within the GTA that carry home safety devices. Uh, they could be purchased or they could be rented. Uh, there's also several other means in which to acquire these devices, a few being, so one, self-pay. Uh, the other is through the Ontario Assistive Devices Program, but I'll go into a little bit of detail about kind of their restrictions on what they will cover. Um, also, private insurance sometimes will cover the equipment, charitable organizations, and as we'll see a little bit later, um, we have another guest speaker two guest speakers coming from home and community care from this hospital, um, but getting equipment um, can also be done through them. But just to highlight, for clients who qualify, equipment through the home and community care, which was formerly the CCAC, um, is available on loan for 28 days, after which time clients need to either purchase or rent the equipment or obtain their own should they wish to continue. So again, Teresa and Tina, our, hosp our hospital care coordinators that will be in a little bit later, um, can elaborate a bit more about that. All right, so if you haven't heard of the AD our ADP program, um, it's a program to provide consumers um, to provide consumer center support and funding to Ontario residents who have long-term physical disabilities and to provide access to personalized assistive, assistive devices appropriate for the individual's basic needs. So the devices covered by the program are intended to enable people with physical disabilities to increase their independence through access to assistive devices responsive to their individual needs. So, going back. I kind of put my foot in my mouth, I guess, but so the ADP program, um, unfortunately, doesn't uh, cover bathroom equipment, such as bath and shower chairs, toileting aids, and grab bars. Um, however, uh, personal insurers may cover such equipment, as I mentioned earlier, so definitely check with your insurance coverage. Um, generally with ADP, just to give you some background, only one mobility device is prescribed specifically by an ADP authorized therapist, which is usually done in the community. Actually, we don't have ADP authorized therapists working in the hospital. Um, so it would be done um, in the community. So that would be covered, just one of them. So if it's either a wheelchair, a scooter, or a walker, whichever one you tend to use the most, if you're using the wheelchair more, but you need the walker to transfer, ADP will only cover 75% ideally of the cost of the wheelchair, not the walker. So again, this isn't bathroom equipment, but just to give you some food for thought about what ADP offer, offers. Because um, I, I think there's a lot of confusion sometimes about uh, what is, what's covered and what's not. Um, and also, ADP doesn't cover, unfortunately, the cost of repairs. Interesting. Um, care and maintenance of the equipment is essentially the user's responsibility. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, um, I understand some this equipment can be expensive, um, it's tight. So other organizations that help um, fund the costs or sometimes, you know, to a much greater degree will we'll give you a discount. Um, our Easter Seals of Ontario, March of Dimes Canada, the War Amps, Kiwanis, and Lions Club. So home safety. Well, I've only scratched the surface on this important topic and I wanted to keep it basic and applicable. Um, and I think you can see that home safety takes many forms. Um, there are many simple measures that you can take to considerably reduce the chances of you or your loved one being injured at home and also that by minimizing danger, you can maximize independence and hopefully quality of life, right? 
So take home points, prevention. Prevention is key, keeping on that checklist. Do room by room assessments. So again, yeah, routine safety checks of each room. Simplify the environment as much as possible. Who are we channeling? Who's that new um, sensation, Mary Kondo? Yeah, let's channel her, keeping everything simple and neat and tidy, um, increasing contrast and ensuring adequate lighting. Okay, so this is a really exciting part for me. So I've asked my colleague, Oriana Medeiros, to come up and uh, chat a little bit about uh, memory cognition and dementia as it relates to uh, home safety. More specifically, um, she's one of the occupational therapists that, that I've had the pleasure of working with for several years now. She is our mobile acute care for the elderly specialist at Toronto Western Hospital. And I'm just going, I'm going to, um, you know, I'd like to just touch on uh, particular behavioral challenges that can create safety problems within the home. And Oriana will also touch on that. Um, so again, while there are a number of behavioral and sensory problems that are associated with dementia, not every person experiences the disease in the same way. But should you find your loved one exhibiting one or all of these behaviors, I'm going to provide a few, we will be providing a few safety recommendations that may help reduce the associated risk. So I'm going to invite Oriana up to the stage. Yeah. I just wanted to make the session a little bit more, oh, yes. Question, yes. Sure. Hello. Hi. Okay, thanks. Thank you for that presentation. That was great. Um, going back to your slide for the first uh, staircase, um, I had a two-part question. Uh, the first one, in terms of distractions. Um, this one? Yep. Okay. Uh, wouldn't the pictures be a distraction? And second, for someone who may be experiencing uh, visual um, issues because of dementia, for example, impaired judgment, um, the different, the contrast colors, how would that help? The contrasting colors? Oriana, do you want to? Yeah, it helps more with the visual spatial um, aspects of the, of the dementia. So it, the, the, in terms of the contrast being more it, Sorry, it won't be yeah. With depth perception and just the, the uh, oh, yeah. oh my gosh, okay, hello. Um, yeah, so it would just help with the depth perception and um, just in terms of the, the visual spatial. Uh, so how your vision and brain is interpreting uh, the spacing and the depth of those steps may not be the same. There might be some changes for the person with dementia. So that's why the contrast and the color. Um, Yellow it tends to be the traditional color that people go for because it's it's yeah it the pops pop. out it's yeah. bright yeah but I agree pictures here that would be a distractor yeah. for sure sorry there's another question sorry I just have a quick question um, are you is there concern about glass shower doors being unsafe I have glass shower doors yeah like if someone has a history of falls is that something or not so much more supervision. The okay. Not, not okay. so much. It depends if it's on if it's just the shower stall or are you talking about the, those black and white? Like a shower stall. With a shower stall. Yeah. No, I think that's that's fine. Okay. The, Sorry, oh, this mic. So I think it's more of a, pro we always recommend, I've done some home visits in the past and we would traditionally recommend that those uh, sliding doors on top of the tub with the shower be removed and that you use a, a curtain instead so that you can put proper railing um, and seats. Uh, but in terms of a shower stall, it's fine. I guess in terms of the depth, again, not, not being able to see. I w if, where there's the handle, you could put some stripe again, some strips to, um, differentiate the the opening and where the handle is yeah but thank you other questions Oriana. Oriana. Okay. i was gonna say also in respect to the shower stalls depends on how the door swings yes. that you want to make sure that it, it, it both ways so that when they're coming in it opens yes. and the space also too it needs to be a good space <laughs> Um, 
Just a quick question. You had mentioned um, safety checklists for all the different rooms in the house. Yeah. I don't expect you to go into it now, but is it possible to, do you have a document or something you could share or a, a resource you could point us to so we could share that with other clients? The, the Alzheimer's Society has um, some resources in that regard. Um, I haven't I didn't actually, I should have put it on. That's some good feedback for the next time. I should actually put a snapshot of one. But um, no, we do know that the Alzheimer's Society does have that. If you have access to go online and printing the PDF, sure. they do. Thank no, you. Sorry. That's probably the most, the best, resource. the best resource, most reliable. Okay, there was one comment online I just wanted to read out. Um, someone also found that uh, automatic lights that turn on with movement are helpful in the bathroom oh, okay. and night lights in general throughout the home. Yeah. Uh, uh, so in other words, never leaving any areas completely dark. So they found that this was helpful. Absolutely. It's okay. great. Thank great. you. Okay. Okay. So I'm just going to uh, talk about some tips. Um, and maybe some very simple strategies around uh, that can help with the, uh, the sensory and the memory impairment that comes along with uh, dementia and, and uh, how it relates to home safety. Um, I've had the opportunity to do some home visits even though I work in an acute care facility. Uh, sometimes I'm able to go on certain cases, um, actually go out with a person with dementia in the family and visit the home and make some immediate recommendations, but we always rely on the fact that we have the Lynn, um, the Lynn uh, occupational therapist that we can refer to and work with. Um, so, I mean, it's probably the best resource when it comes to trying to figure out uh, what are the best strategies for a person in, in, within their own environment. Um, so I'll just, I'll just start with the first slide. So memory problems can make it hard for uh, anyone, for the person with dementia to do their daily activities. It doesn't matter in terms of the, the spectrum of the dementia, whether it's, it, it can start as in the early stages, middle and late stages. You're gonna see just a different um, varying degree of uh, how memory impairment will impact a person's daily activities. Uh, so learning new things can also be more difficult at any stage, uh, especially if you're going to introduce something as simple as a walker or how to use a, a new handrail on the tub or seat or that kind of thing. Depending on where they're at in, their, in the stage of dementia, that can be difficult uh, to, to learn. Uh, so it's through you know, practicing and, and um, orienting the person to the safe use of the, of the equipment that the person will become more comfortable and, and adapt to it. Things um, that you know a person has been doing um, for years may become even may become more hard to do as well. Okay, so in terms of what you can do around the home um, or in, in your daily routine to maintain, it's important that a person with dementia maintains their autonomy, their independence. It's possible um, the, in the early stages and that, that they can be as independent as possible, but within with maintaining some safety around the home. So just try to do the same things, as, uh, the same sorry, the same things, the same at the same time each day. Um, so routine, uh, it, and habits, habits and routine actually do help to maintain the independence and with, an act, with active, sorry, activities of daily living. Make a to-do list that you can cross off to help with some um, short-term memory problems. Use a calendar or notebook uh, to keep track of important dates, appointments, and information. Um, that might be a, a tip that's useful more in the early stages of the dementia, maybe not so much in the, mo the later stages. Um, use pill organizers. There are also pill boxes that where if, you, if it, the need becomes that you have to hide the medication or uh, keep it out of sight, there are safety pill boxes that you can purchase. Uh, keep imp important night. I think we mentioned this about keys and other important items where you can see them in, in the same place each time and then label your cupboard. So these are things that the occupational, a community occupational therapist can help the, the individual dementia and the family um, you know, work through in terms of what uh, some of uh, the strategies that might help to compensate for the memory impairment. Uh, so keeping, sorry, labeling cupboards and drawers with words and pictures that describe what's inside, 
asking, um, so just touching on, on uh, some of the areas of, of your daily activities that may be uh, impacted by short-term memory loss, even early on, could be the, like managing your finances and your banking, so you're going to have to enlist the help of uh, family members, or family members have to be kind of vigilant and, and monitor to see if those, uh, you know, bills are not piling up and um, that, you know, certain things are being missed in terms of bank statements, that kind of thing. Um, and then post science to remind you that to turn off appliances and lock your doors and that kind of thing. So this is something where the, a, a community occupational therapist could be very um, helpful with. Um, I know I've had to make some of these suggestions myself when I do home visits, but I'm only there for one visit. Yeah, I, yeah we want questions actually. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, more of a suggestion. Yes. Uh, the other study actually has developed a tip sheet for memory that is it's been developed by a group of people who have Alzheimer's disease. Yes. Early stage and that is a I'm from the Alzheimer's Society. So I oh, it is excellent. available on yes. our website. Yeah, we relate yeah. yeah, we rely on you. And UHN has a little bit on within the uh, patient education um, library. We do have a, some of the pamphlets that could be helpful as well, but definitely the Alzheimer's Society. Oh, uh, just touching a bit on uh, hearing and communication. So in terms of communicating with someone with dementia, again, you can go to the Alzheimer's Society and they have a, many, many different pamphlets and education material. So meeting the person where they're at uh, and accepting their new reality is very important and trying not to argue with the person or, um, um, sorry, I forgot my thought. Yeah, or correcting them. That's That can cause a bit of a, um, you know, um, and it is, yeah, distress. Um, so in terms of some tips for the caregivers, so you may need, and of course a person with, um, with dementia or memory impairment can, may need some additional time to adapt to the new hearing aids. Uh, oh, sorry, if they're needing hearing aids, voice amplifiers and eyeglasses. Um, so, and in, in the home, it's important to monitor the person's ability to uh, use uh, things like the television and telephone and computer and email, uh, radio, etc., and just to try to, uh, you know, uh, adapt those devices if if need be, just in, in, to maintain independence when using those uh, those devices. It's important for your loved one to maintain communication with family, friends, and that they feel connected with the outside world. Um, and then just ensure that they are wearing their hearing aids. It's, I often find that, uh, especially if it's being introduced later on uh, or it, at the beginning of the, when the dementia process is setting in, introducing new aids like hearing aids and eyeglasses, it can be a bit of a challenge for the family and the caregivers to uh, ensure that they are wearing, their loved one is wearing these devices. Uh, again, so just making communication a two-way process, of course, engaging the person with dementia in conversation. Um, they may need, may need more time to process their information, so you have to be patient. And um, again, when you're communicating with someone, you have to gain their attention, be clear and concise. Uh, you sometimes may have to use actions, gestures, not just words, and just always be respectful and, uh, and try not to use childish or demeaning language. Okay. So, kind of touching on all the senses a bit, um, in addition to uh, age-related visual changes, some types of dementia may impact a person's vision, but not as a result of a problem with their eyes, but because of a problem with their brain. So people can have a lot of difficulty seeing shades of the same color and have increased success when there's a high degree of contrast, as Oriana and I mentioned earlier. For example, black on yellow. People's senses of perception and depth may also be altered. All of these situations can cause safety concerns. Uh, we'll quickly review a few safety tips. We also have a comprehensive um, bunch of handouts outside for you to uh, to gather if you're interested for some further information. Um, but kind of going forward, ensuring that we're creating color contrast between floors and walls will help the person see depth. Floor coverings are less visually confusing if they are a solid color. And really this rule can be translated to all areas where solid colors are found to be less confusing than say for instance a patterned wall or patterned rug. 
Use dishes and placemats in contrasting colors for easier identifi identification. Mark the edges of steps, as we've mentioned a million times before, uh, with brightly colored strips of tape to outline uh, changes in height. Place brightly colored signs or simple pictures on doors to important rooms, for example, the bathroom, or cupboards for easier identification. Make sure there is adequate lighting. Dimly lit areas may produce confusing shadows or difficulty with interpreting everyday objects. Try to maintain consistency and vary the home environment as little as possible to minimize the potential for confusion. Keep objects and furniture in the same place. And finally, if there are pets in the environment, be aware that they might blend in with the floor or lie in walkways that may be a tripping hazard. So you can put a brightly colored bandana or vest on the animal that will help the person with dementia see the animal. Wandering. So, if your loved one is exhibiting wandering tendencies, uh, these are a few strategies that may help minimize the safety risk within your home. Firstly, remove clutter and clear the pathways from room to room and on the stairs to prevent falls and allow the person with dementia to move more freely. Make sure floors provide good traction for walking or pacing Use non-skid floor wax or leave floors unpolished. Secure all rug edges, eliminate throw rugs, or install non-skid strips. All of us, but especially someone with dementia who is at an increased risk for falls, should be wearing non-skid shoes or sneakers. Ensure that footwear fits well and that the soles aren't worn, that laces are tied, and that straps are fastened, and they're flat, no heels. Place locks uh, high or low, wherever, uh, on exit doors so that they're out of direct sight, so they're out of direct eye level sight. Use door alarms, such as those bells above the door, or devices that ring when the doorknob is touched or the door is opened. Divert the attention of the person with dementia away from the door by placing scenic posters on the door, placing removable gauges, curtains, or wallpaper that matches the adjoining walls. You can also place signs on the door that say stop, closed. Um, this may help deter the patient uh, from continuing forward. Install safety devices found in hardware stores to limit how much windows uh, can be opened. Um, again, the Alzheimer's uh, Society of Canada has partnered with the Canadian Medical Alert Foundation to offer at cost registration with the Safely Home program. As well, notify neighbours of your loved one's potential to wander or become lost. Ask them to contact you or the police immediately if the person is seen alone or on the move. If your loved one has or is exhibiting rummaging, rummaging or hiding ten object tendencies, again, remembering to lock up dangerous or toxic products, remove oil, old or spoiled food, remove clutter and valuable items, and keep trash cans out of sight. All right, so this leads us to the next portion of our presentation. Oh, do you have any questions? Anything? No? Um, Shrid, your, your colleague just uh, sent some uh, information. So for people who are interested in more information from the Alzheimer's Society, there is, uh, two, um, there is a webinar as well. Um, if people want to write down the, the address, it's www.altseducate.ca, so A-L-Z, educate.ca. And there are a, um, a lot of brochures and resources on this topic on the website as well. And you can find it on alzheimer.ca. And you can just uh, click home. So there's a lot of information there as well. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Patricia. And Patricia. Okay, so um, 
we have two lovely guests here, uh, Teresa Gumas and Tina Vango. Um, both uh, work at Toronto Western Hospital and are hospital care coordinators. And I thought it might just be great to have them here, uh, field any questions you might have about any community supports or any questions. Come up, guys. Hello, good morning. Hi everyone. I'm Tina. Hi. I'm Teresa. So we're, um, we're going to do this very kind of laid back and casual. So if anybody has any questions, just stop us. Um, we're not going to, we don't have any slides. We're just going to be kind of uh, talking to you casually. Okay. Do you want to go ahead or um, do you want me to start? You can With, start. Okay. So we're from um, the LIN, the Local Health Integration Network, uh, which used to be called the CCAC, which many of you may have heard. Um, so basically our responsibilities are to help connect clients uh, to services in their community, either in their home or to local clinics. Uh, we're 14 LINs across Ontario. They are, have OHIP um, covered services, and we're funded by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. So um, each LIN works a little bit differently in terms of their budgets and their resources. So what might be available to some people here in Toronto may not be um, as readily available living somewhere else or vice versa. Um, and uh, you do, you're, it's covered by OHIP, did I say that already? Okay, mm -hmm. yes, OHIP covered yeah. services. And um, what we do is we do contract service um, providers in, in the community, um, OT, PT, PSW, nursing, speech, so, um, and you're assessed for eligibility based on need. So, yeah. so we conduct, um an assessment and based on that assessment we can determine um, what you're eligible for in terms of personal support worker hours and uh, other services and just to kind of tack on to um, previous uh, Natalie and Oriana uh, what we one of the I guess in regards to home safety assessments we uh, generally do this a lot as well where we can have an OT go into one's home, uh, assess the home situation, make recommendations for um, any modifications, either in a bathroom, um, even just even making the recommendations, like you said, if there's uh, rugs down, just to pick the rugs up, mm -hmm. um, any uh, equipment recommendations in the bathroom, mobility. Uh, we also, uh, can have the OT follow up in regards to um, cognition and assessment and falls making prevention. falls prevention um, and even just uh, so I'm losing my train of thought. Yeah, even equipment recommendations, as Tina was saying, mm -hmm. home safety assessments, falls prevention, um, helping um, clients obtain equipment. Right. Um, Normally, for clients who qualify, you can obtain um, equipment through us. Uh, the equipment is generally free of charge for the first 28 days, and after which time um, there's a, a purchase fee or a loan fee associated with the equipment um, rentals, with the equipment through us. Mm -hmm. um, or you can go out and get your own equipment. Um, Often the occupational therapist in the hospital will give you a vendor's list if you need it. Um, but our, T our OTs in the community can still follow up. Um, yeah. Uh, we also have physiotherapy. They do things such as transfer training and gate training in the home. Um, usually, you know, for clients who are deconditioned or have had a change in status since being in hospital, um, that's another service. And we also mentioned the personal support mm -hmm. worker for assistance with activities of daily living, such as bathing, dressing, personal care. And, um, oh, oops, did I press something? I shouldn't, oh, it's the end. Okay. <laughs> uh, one of our <clears throat> roles as well in the community, and even here in hospital, is uh, to, uh, cons we, we can speak to families in regards to future planning. Mm -hmm. So if anybody ever has um, 
an interest in long-term care or retirement homes or um, you know we can help provide lists of what's in the community uh, wait times mm -hmm. I mean this is all online but if you have any questions about a particular home um, we can do our best to, to give you that information and, and case uh, management yeah through. yeah and we I'm can just... link to other community resources um, adult day programs um, respite right yeah um, so normally clients in the community are assigned a district care coordinator who would follow up with a home visit and um, discuss all of those options with clients and their families. Any questions so far? No, no. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's why I thought it might be fruitful to have, have this kind of discussion of it. But, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you so and much. No problem. Um, just one, can I ask one question of the audience? Um, has anyone had any specific experiences with home care that they would like to share, talk about, or? No? I'm just going to ask people. Yeah, that's okay. great. Okay. While Maria is just checking, to um, one of the things we can add is uh, how we how you make a referral, either for yourself or loved one. So we've actually uh, put together some packages out out um, on the table. So if everyone just wants to help themselves to it, um, you can self refer. You can self refer for yourself. You can self refer for a family member. Um, it, you would just call the local number and uh, it actually if you're in your home or in your loved one's home it's kind of we have the same sort of thing that Bell has it's 310-2222 um, and it links you directly to the local Lynn in your neighborhood so if you live in Mississauga but your loved one lives in Toronto and you're in Mississauga and you call 310-222 not a good idea because it'll link you to your uh, your um, local lens. So we have the numbers uh, listed there. You can make a referral if it's for occupational therapy. Um, it doesn't need a doctor's referral. The only time we do need uh, a doctor's referral is if um, there's any kind of a treatment that's required, an injection, uh, medication administration, um, okay. wound care. But if you need, uh, if your loved one needs personal support or occupational therapy, if you're worried about the home, you can simply just call our information and referral. You'll need um, the, your loved one's OHIP and uh, you'll be asked a number of questions and the process starts. Mm -hmm. So, Maria, does anybody? No? Okay. okay. Um, no questions? Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, did I need to return? Thank you. Okay. I'm just going to thank everybody uh, for coming out today. Um, this is a very important topic. Um, so I found, I hope, I hope we found it informative for everybody. Um, so I want a special thank you to Natalie and Oriana and Tina and Teresa for coming out and uh, sharing and um, telling us a lot more about home and safety. Okay, thank you.